Hello, everybody, and a very warm welcome to this webinar, which is the first that we're doing for MPN Voice um, on our own, our first Zoom webinar, um, and focusing on post-ASH, which is the American Society of Hematology, uh, and the results that have come from there. We have to say a huge note of thanks to our doctors, Professor Claire Harrison, Dr. John Lambert, Dr. Beth Saylor, and Dr. Natalia, Natalia Curtio Garcia, who have been incredibly good and kind to give their time to help us. Just a quick um, housekeeping. Um, I know that many of you have seen this before, but I would please ask you any photos or screenshots taken of any slides used by the presenters can really only be for your personal use and reference for copycat copyright and data protection. They must not, please not be posted onto any social media pages, platforms, websites, or online forums. Now, the very exciting panel Q&A session, the speakers will answer questions during the panel Q&A session, but they can't answer any personalized questions regarding to your MPN or your treatment plan. Please refer those back to your own hematology team. You can also, as the um, webinar goes on, you can um, also add more questions using the chat box. Um, and we will try and get all the questions answered. Um, but we, you know, we it may take we may have too many to to answer them all today. But we will get back to you. Feedback. I'd be really, really grateful if you could complete the feedback survey, which will be emailed to you after the forum. Um, and you know, we we'd love to hear what you would like us to do, what you feel that we can do to help you even more. So those feedback forms are really essential. Well, I'm just going to briefly. <laughs> tell you what the slide should be, which is a brief overview of MPN Voice. I know that we're welcoming um, viewers from Australia, Canada, the USA, Jersey and Ireland. And some of you may not have been to one of our webinars before. So I'm just going to give a brief overview of what MPN Voice does. We're here to serve the MPN community, uh, both patients and healthcare professionals, and provide you with accurate and up-to-date information which is medically verified. Uh, we support patients and their families. But what I really, really recommend you do is look at our website, which is mpnvoice.org.uk. You will see there a full list of things that we do, um, and we would love to welcome you into the MPN community. Uh, now, I'm just going to hand over to Professor Claire Harrison, who will introduce the clinical team. And thank you all for coming today. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining, especially on a Friday evening. Um, I'm really grateful to my clinical colleagues um, for joining and to the MPN Voice team for organising this meeting. So I'm just going to ask my colleagues just to um, briefly say hi and introduce themselves, and then we'll move on. So, um, John, over to you. Hi, thanks Claire, thanks everybody. I'm John Lambert, I'm a haematology consultant at UCLH in London, um, and I lead our MPN service there, and I'm really happy to be meeting you all today. That's great, thanks so much John. And um, Beth? Hi, I'm Beth Pseider, I'm a haematology consultant as well in the University of Oxford, um, and I also run a research group here focused on understanding why people develop MPNs and uh, developing new therapies. Nice to meet you all. And Natalia? Oh, hi, I'm Natalia Cruz. I'm one of the hematology consultants in guys. Um, I work in MPN and I'm also doing clinical trials for MPN patients. Thank you for having me. Great. Thanks for joining, Natalia. I really appreciate it. You're going to keep us all in order in the panel discussion, I know. So um, we're going to talk about um, the ASH meeting and I'm hoping you can all see my slide. Um, I'm telling you all my secrets now. That's not good. So the I'm going to talk about myelofibrosis. Um, but first of all, I thought I'd tell you a bit about what is ASH. So it's 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 it stands for American Society of Hematology. And it is the biggest meeting in the sort of hematology calendar in terms of sort of um research. And um the purpose really is about collaboration, scientific and clinical exchange, 
networking and people come to present their data and ideas and have a discussion and it's a very big meeting so I've shown you on this um slide just some kind of pictures that were taken from the meeting this is a massive presentation hall with many sleep um additional screens um, and and many, many rows of people who come from all over the world. This year, there were 32,000 attendees at this meeting, 28,000 of them in, purpose, in, in person. You can see that the hallways got really busy. Some of the um, presentations are made verbally and some of them are made on in sort of posters and there's a lot of discussion usually over a beer and with a pretzel we are in America um, for the posters and at this year's meeting there were more than 6,000 items of work um, submitted in this sort of abstract form so this evening I'm going to talk to you about myelofibrosis John is going to talk about PV and DT and Beth's going to talk about latest scientific um, updates so what was new at the ASH meeting for myelofibrosis was um, a randomized control trial, that's what RCT stands for, which was known as Freedom2 with a JAK inhibitor called Fedratinib. So that's important and I'll tell you why. Results of two studies looking at combining a JAK inhibitor with another drug in as a first therapy and updates on many other agents. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about that. And I'm going to put it in the context of UK practice specifically because MPN Voice is a UK charity, but it's applicable for those of you who've joined from other countries. So Fedratinib is a different um, JAK inhibitor. It's a second one that was approved across um, the world, but it was approved really without a sort of randomized study for patients who had um, lost their response to ruxolitinib. And so we did this study and showed um, that there was a lot of benefit for patients who had um, failed ruxolitinib when this drug, fedratinib, which is a tablet, was compared to standard therapies. And this was regardless of whether patients' disease had got worse or whether they developed anemia or low platelets on ruxolitinib and whether the platelet count was low at the beginning or not. And these are all things that we know affect response to ruxolitinib. One of the problems with fedratinib in its development was patients develop this thing called Wernicke's encephalopathy, which is due to thym low thiamine levels. And it is thought that um, fedratinib might affect the metabolism or the absorption of thiamine. But we also know that thiamine levels can be low in patients with myelofibrosis. And what we found in the study was that about one in five patients who were taking fedratinib and about one in 20 patients who were on the control arm actually had low levels of thiamine. So this is important. It's about balanced nutrition. And um, what we would do in our practice now is we would give patients who are taking fedratinib thiamine supplements. But we also think about other patients um, about their nutrition as well. Um, another thing with um, fedratinib is um, that it does cause um, stomach um, issues when patients start taking it. And we were able to show that this was quite well managed in this study. And so uh, where we are at the present time in terms of this is just putting this data in context. If we are treating a patient up front with myelofibrosis, we... Um, in Europe have ruxolitinib, maybe fedratinib, but it's more of a second line drug, and we have momolotinib. And there are certain features of a patient that would make us maybe want to use one drug more than the other. Momolotinib in particular has recently been approved um, for patients with a low hemoglobin or anemia. And um, this is a the segment of patients where we might be thinking about using that drug. Pacritinib is approved in America, 
but it's not approved in Europe or the rest of the world. And it's specifically for patients with low platelets, less than 50. But we can use momolotinib, particularly in a second line. So after one type of treatment already, we can use momolotinib uh, in patients with low platelets. So we do have that option. So where would I think about using fedratinib? Well, if I could, and I can't currently in the UK, I might use it as a first line therapy if patients have got platelets between 50 and 100 and a very large spleen. And there are some problems with immune suppression with ruxolitinib. And John um, in particular has done a lot of work collecting data across the UK about skin cancers with ruxolitinib. And we may see less of that with fedratinib, but that's a sort of personal opinion. And to be honest, our hands are a bit tied with what treatments we can give to patients in which line. In the... Um, I told you there were also two trials comparing new therapies for patients when they first need a treatment. And these were the two studies. Transform 1, which was using a drug called Novitaclax, which targets um, cell death. And Manifest 2, which was using a drug called Pelabresib, which is a BET inhibitor. And these two studies were both presented. And unfortunately, it's such a massive conference that the two studies were pretty much presented at almost the same time and in rooms almost a kilometre apart. So it, that people were running between the rooms, but luckily this is a conference that's also um, shown real time so we, can, we could see the data. Broadly, the two studies were quite similar and I'm going to show you the data in the next few slides, but the Navitaclax study had more patients who had higher risk disease, so more patients with intermediate two risk disease using a prognostic score, and more patients stopped taking um, that treatment. Dose of ruxolitinib was lower for patients who were on the combination than it was for pelabresib, and spleen responses were very, very good with both of these agents, and I'll show you some um, pictures of that. We also had to judge um, benefit based on reduction of symptoms. We use this thing called TSS50, which is a 50% reduction in symptoms. Navitaclax was probably the same as the control arm here. Um, so sorry, I seem to have lost this. Things happen. Here we go. Um, so Navitaclax was pretty much the same. Pelabresib was a bit better. So this is the proportion of patients that had 50% reduction, but it wasn't sufficiently better. And there were some patients who had better anemia and more reduction of fibrosis, but the story is really still emerging between these treatments. So just to quickly show you, um, this is the patients on the manifest study with Pelabresib. This is what happened at 24 weeks to the spleen reduction. So we were targeting 35%. These are the patients in gray on the control arm and in blue is the added benefit of the combination. But you can see there wasn't much difference um, for symptoms, although perhaps some just not significant. We need a, a number here of 0.0 five and it was just over that unfortunately despite the fact that this is the second biggest study we've ever done for myelofibrosis but if you look at the data in a different way you could ask the question which patients had both a spleen response and a symptom response and you can see that there was almost double the number of patients that were achieving this benefit with the combination than with um, only ruxolitinib um, there was a little bit more data shown. So hemoglobin tended to be better. This is dark blue. This is a combination um, compared to control and slightly fewer patients needing transfusions. So this data is all sort of emerging. It was very hot off the press just before ASH and we're expecting some more updates. And it's possible that this is enough to change the way we treat um, myelofibrosis in the frontline, also first therapy, but it's it's not enough at the present time. 
Side effects are important, of course, because these are the things that you experience when you take a drug. But uh, interestingly, and this is a very interesting way, this is called a butterfly plot. So this was the combination. This is the proportion of patients that had the side effect. The different colors reflect the different grade. So the higher the grade, the worse the side effect. And you can see that broadly, actually, the two treatment arms were similar, but there was slightly more diarrhea and change in taste, which is what dyskusia is, um, with the combination. But interestingly, and aligned with uh, an, being less anemia, we also saw less fatigue. For the TRANSFORM2 study, you need to remember that we were recruiting patients with a higher risk profile. We didn't intend to do that. It is just the way the cookie crumbled when the studies um, were um, recruited. Here you can see that the spleen, this is just a different way of showing it, spleen responses were still really good but symptoms were no better, and though they were certainly no worse, which is also important when it comes to adding two drugs together. This just shows that there was a more anemia and more low platelet counts for patients treated with this combination, which is what we expect to see. So can we do better than just giving a single treatment which is often a JAK inhibitor for myelofibrosis patients. So the summary from the ASH meeting would be, neither of these studies sufficiently met the endpoints that are required through kind of licensing and scientific rigor to be definitively approved and we will rely on later updates. A question is also, is it better to use a combination up front? Many of us were taught, and, and several of us were taught by the same people, it's always better to give your best treatment first. But it might be better in this disease to rescue a patient with a combination. And there is still a study with Navitaclax. And there are other studies with um, drugs known as Selenexor and Navitamadlin open currently across the globe. Questions for us is, is it, is it the right thing to rely on a symptom improvement when we all know symptoms might be affected by side effects? And um, at this time on a Friday, having done a full week, I'm pretty tired. And if I did my uh, MPN 10 score, I probably would score some points. So is it reasonable to expect to really significantly reduce even further? Some of the things we are looking at, and I think Beth will probably show you th this, is um, illustrated by this other abstract, which was a different JAK inhibitor and a different BET inhibitor. And here you can see that we saw some reduction in the amount of abnormal JAK2. And in the bone marrow, these are the megakaryocytes, the platelet-producing cells. This black stain, which is silver, was the reticulin. And you can see over time that these megakaryocytes are, which are touching or so-called clustered here, which is what we expect to see as a feature of disease, became more normal. And the amount of black lines here has reduced. So this is something that we're really looking at, asking, is this more reliable as an endpoint? So the implications for the UK We've recently republished our national so-called BSH or British Society of Hematology guidelines that was done as a collaboration across the UK um, group. We currently have access for our patients to ruxolitinib, fedratinib and momolotinib, but percritinib only via a clinical trial. And there are no current combination therapies in routine use, but there are the trials that I mentioned open. And there are several clinical trials um, open looking at combining to get better biological results, but also focusing on anemia, such as with agents such as Lospatacept and um, other drugs such as this one called CUR050. In the UK, we have got not only um, pharmaceutical company trials, but we also have a strong history of what we call academic studies. This is one, this is Fedora. So this is Fedratinib combined with interferon which we think is a really important and potentially um, very interesting combination. 
We also have the Promise Study, which is being run by our lovely colleague Adam Mead. And you'll recognise the Dreaming Spires of Oxford here. And this is for patients in the second line setting using a drug which is quite similar to pelabresib. We are also um, opening a, a study called Ascend MPN, so Donal McLaurin, myself, Adam and Steve Napper in um, Cardiff are looking at this study for patients with very high risk disease. So got increasing blasts or bad mutations. And this will be very important because we're collecting a lot of samples and looking at scientific advances. We also are waiting for the results with Calar targeted therapies. And I'm going to not talk about those anymore because I'm sure Beth is going to talk about them in, in more detail. But we're all really excited potentially about these drugs. So I'm going to stop sharing now and hand over to John who is going to talk about PV and ET. And just to say to everyone, do feel free to, if you've got extra questions, do pop them in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them. Thanks, over to you, John. Thanks, Claire, it's a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. So I'm going to focus on ET and PV. I can try to share my slides, bear with me a second. confidently. Um, right, hopefully you can see. Can you see my presenter screen okay? Yes. Wonderful, good. Right, so first of all, yes, as Claire was saying at the beginning, ASH is now a huge, huge thing. I think there's only about three or four cities in the US that are big enough, or our conference centers big enough to host it. I remember when I first started my haematology training, over 20 years ago now getting to UCH and all I could hear for the first month or two is are you going to ASH who's going to ASH are you presenting at ASH it took me a little while to work out what ASH is but it is an absolute institution in kind of the kind of world haematology sort of um, community so it is huge there's a lot of an awful lot of data abstracts presented and often this, this kind of challenge if you like is trying to work out what's important what's just interesting um, and what potentially is going to make a difference to both our scientific understanding of the different hematological dis disorders and also uh, how we treat things. I focus really very much on the clinical side of things, so not really the disease biology, but just the, the actual management, and I've focused on PV and ET. Um, there are four um, studies which I'm going to be talking about. Um, one is the is the, a newish drug called resfertide in PV, which is a revived study. The second paper I'm going to focus on, or abstract, is bomodemstat, which is again a newish drug in ET and quite exciting because we haven't really had any new drugs in ET for quite a while. The third um, uh, paper is. Uh, a really interesting kind of data collection on young, potentially very young patients with ET and PV, looking at kind of what the natural history is for people who develop ET and PV under the age of 25, and also uh, how um, different treatments affect the disease course. And finally, there's a Danish um, study comparing kind of what a lot of us are interested in, hydroxycarbamide versus pegylate interferon as first line treatment for MPN. So those are the four things I'm going to focus on and hopefully towards the end, come back to sort of ask the questions, what have we learned? Does it change what we do? So resfertide in PV, so polycythemia vera, as we know, um, usually caused by JAK2 mutation and that causes the stem cells to produce too many red cells um, or produce red cells too quickly. Conventionally, what we often do uh, is either by itself or in combination with um, tablet or interferon treatment, we, we, we give people venesections where we take off about half a litre of blood at a time. And what that means is that eventually people become iron deficient and then iron deficiency slows down the rate at which their stem cells can produce red blood cells. And that eventually means that people's hematocrit comes down below what we would want, which is a target of below 45%. But venesection is a very old fashioned kind of treatment. It's very effective, but it can have side effects, um, particularly the iron deficiency. And people can get symptoms from iron deficiency, particularly fatigue. 
So this is a new drug trying to effectively could do, if you like, venesection in a slightly kind of different, more modern way, if you like. So it is what's called a hepcidin memetic. And it's designed like venesection to slow down the supply of iron to the red cells, but it does it in a very different way. What it does, so if we look at this diagram here, the key bit, if you like, of the orange dots, hopefully you can see my pointer, um, the orange dots, um, which are the iron, and normally what happens is as the um, old red blood cells die, they release their iron into what's called macrophages. The macrophages then basically digests them and then spits out the iron, which can then go back into making new red blood cells. And what hepcidin, uh, what um, Respertide does, it effectively locks that iron inside the macrophage. So the iron gets sort of stuck inside there and can't be recycled back into the bone marrow and for the stem cells. So it is effectively depriving or really slowing down the amount of iron that's available for, for the stem cells. And the aim is it can reduce the rate of red cell production without needing to do venesection. So it was people who've got PV, who needed at least three venesections in the 28 weeks leading up to entry to the trial to keep the hematocrit below what for most people is a target of 0.45 or 45% hematocrit. So there were two cohorts, I'll come to them in, in, in turn, but about half, the, just over half the patients were venesection only, and the remainder were requiring venesections and site reductive treatment like hydroxycarbamide or interferon. Just go back to look at this group here. I'm just going to talk you through what this um, swimmer's plot, as it's called, is showing. So each row, as we go down the swimmer's plot, is a different patient. So if we look at the top patient, it's a 58 year old female. And this is her progress during the um, study. So this section is the 28 weeks before the actual drug was given. You can see here the green line for all these patients is when they receive their first dose. And then there's a part one, which is when they're receive, uh, receiving the drug, the resfertide drug and the dose um, could be adjusted. And then there's also what's called a pink area. My point has disappeared. There's a pink area, which is when the drug was potentially um, stopped temporarily. And then the purple line is when it was restarted. And if you look here, these red triangles are each venesection that this lady needed, or the second patient down is a man. But you can see, so this lady needed four venesections before starting the drug, the resfertide. Once she was on the resfertide, all of a sudden, no venesections. When it was stopped, this little pink bit here, she then needed two more. But then once she's back on it in the purple bar, she doesn't need any. And overall, you can see that all the patients needed venesections and often quite a lot of venesections in the 28 weeks before they received the dose of resfertide. And as soon as they're on it, the number of red triangles diminishes dramatically and only starts to increase again for these areas, either the pink bars or these diagonal um, sort of uh, uh, black slashes. Um, for most patients, that was the, the real only time that they needed many venesections. So it's a similar pattern as well for those who are receiving cytoreduction. reduction. So you can start to see just from this visual plot how effective the resfertide was at reducing the need to venesections. And in many people, this went out for a long, long time. You can see it's going out for two or three years. You can see here how it was sustained. So we want to keep the hematocrit below 45% at all times. And this is going out to whatever it is, two and a half years. And you can see for most of these patients, the hematocrit, so th this is an average with what's called confidence intervals. Um, and you can see that the overall, for the two and a half years, the average was contained well below the target of 45%. This was the group who had the um, resfertide removed or stopped rather, for a few weeks, just to see what happens if you stop it. And you can see within a few weeks, the hematocrit gets almost back to 45%. So this isn't a long acting drug. As soon as you stop it, the effects will wear off quite quickly. Now, ideally, we don't want it to have too much of an effect on the white cells or the platelets. The white cells, as you can see, remain fairly stable. 
The playlist did go up initially from four, an average of 450 up to 600, but then slowly, slowly came back down. So it doesn't seem to have much effect on platelets. Now, this is really interesting because it's controlling the hematocrit. And yet the ferritin, which is a marker of iron stores, remember I said that people who've been venesected often become iron deficient. That's how in, in many ways venesection works. But often their ferritin levels like here, these are the average people starting on the study, were low, but gradually over time, the ferritin increased back to the normal range. And what we would hope is that the symptoms of iron deficiency start to improve. So we can see, for instance, fatigue. So on this um, chart here, any the further to the left these blue dots are, the better the symptom has improved. You can see all of these key symptoms improved because they're all to the left of this midline. You can see fatigue, early satiety, which means being able to, you know, or not feeling hung, sorry, not feeling full when you try to eat. Inactivity, concentration problems, night sweats and pruritus all seem to improve on resveratide. What, what about adverse reactions? Well, they were generally mild. It's an injected drug, so the most common side effect was injection site reactions. Um, fatigue, but for people get fatigued for lots of reasons. It's difficult to know whether that was a side effect of the drug or just people having polycythemia. Um, joint ache, um, itch of pruritus. There were five clots seen. That's probably not surprising given you know, the number of patients who were rec recruited. And they did see a number of cancers, most of which you'd expect to see in people um, you know, over this period of time. You know, if you've got enough, follow enough patients for long enough, people will develop other things. So we don't think that's particularly related to the, the risk fertile treatment, but it is something that needs to be monitored. So the conclusions from this study that resveratide, this hepcidin mimetic, which locks up the um, ferret, uh, locks up iron into the macrophages, provided long-term control of hematocrit, reduced the need for venesections. We saw the iron levels or ferritin levels go back to normal. We saw a number of symptoms get better, and generally it was well tolerated. So this is really quite an exciting um, new drug, and we have been recruiting across the world, including the UK. Um, it was the phase three study, which is, excuse me, which is when um, uh, you're com we're comparing it against placebo. And that's the, really the best, that's the gold standard kind of study. So that's ongoing. So this is now talking about bomb. So this is a second study, bombardemstat in ET. And so this is for people who've had first line treatment, such as with hydroxycarbamide and they haven't been able to get good enough control of their platelet count, so we need something else. Bomodemstat is a new class of drug. It inhibits an enzyme called LSD1. LSD1 controls or it sort of stimulates proliferation of blood stem cells. And by inhibiting it, the idea is it can slow down the production of primarily platelets. In fact, it was originally developed and tested in myelofibrosis for one of the kind of the, the main effects people noticed was it's plate, people on the drug, their platelet count fell. So the natural thing was to look, well, would it work in essential thrombocythemia? So this is the study. The key bits are people obviously had to have ET. It needed to have cytoreduction. So that's really what we call a higher risk group of ET in people who are over 60 or have had a blood clot in the past. And importantly, they need to have had at least one standard therapy, hydroxycarbamide, interferon, et cetera. And either they didn't, their platelet count didn't come down or when they, tried, when they, um, um, when they were taking the, the drug, they got side effects and then they had to stop it, which is what intolerant means. And they started on the bomodemstat uh, and the dose of it was increased or decreased to maintain the platelet count around 200 to 400, that was the target, and then continued longer term. And the main end point was to see how well patients managed with it in terms of side effects, whether any um, nasty um, toxicities, and also um, trying to control the platelet count below 400 without any thromboembolic events, blood clots. 73 patients on the study. And the bottom line is that the main end point 
seven, uh, week 24, over three quarters of patients responded. That's to say their platelet count came down below 400. Don't forget these are people who've already been on a drug which hasn't worked. So this is really quite encouraging and they hadn't had any blood clots. You can see here how quickly the platelet count came down. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is, going, this is time um, on the study. So 10 weeks, 20 weeks on the study, you can see the platelet count already started to come down within the first 46 weeks. By week 12, the average platelet count for the whole group was just on 400, and it continued to slowly come down and stabilize around um, just below 400. Likewise, white cell count came down a bit as well, and that's generally a good thing. White cell count can also be a risk factor for blood clots in ET and PV. So that, but they didn't come down too low. So that's encouraging. And also really encouraging is the fact that the hemoglobin level seems to remain stable. So one of the problems with other drugs, whether it's hydroxycarbamide, even ruxolitinib, when we've tried using it in ET, often really makes people anemic, and that's often not what we want, whereas this drug didn't seem to do that. Now, if we look at this graph here, this is now looking at um, uh, whether it helps symptoms. And the answer is no, it didn't really. So essentially, if uh, bars on the left side of this chart will be mean the symptoms got better, on the right side mean they get worse. And you can see overall, it's a mixture of left or right. So overall, the symptoms didn't particularly get um, better or worse. Perhaps night sweats did get better. This, I think, is a really interesting. So the, so the right-hand panel, the decrease in VAF. VAF means mutant load. So some people with ET might have a JAK2 level of 20% or 30%. But we, what we want to see is how far that comes down. Because there's increasing evidence that if we can suppress the JAK2 level, or if people have got a calreticular mutation and reducing the calreticular level, may end up bringing, it's still quite speculative, but you know, um, longer term benefits. And you can see that in this group of patients, 85% um, had a um, reduction in their mutant level, and some of them down to 50 or 60% reduction. So again, that's really quite impressive. Briefly, just to go through the side effects, 15% um, of people had to stop the drug because of side effects. The most common side effects were dyskusia, which you remember will, is an altered sense of taste, like a metallic or unpleasant taste. Joint pains. We had a number of patients, actually, who developed quite marked um, hip and um, shoulder pain. Um, didn't have to stop the drug, but they needed painkillers for it. Constipation and low platelets are the commonest side effects. Relatively few blood clots. There were a number of bleeding events, but mostly relatively sort of mild bleeding, nosebleeds, gum bleeds, uh, bruising. So generally it was a pretty well um, tolerated um, drug. So in conclusion, it was effective for most patients with ET who had not responded properly to first line treatment. As we said, 77% of patients had got their platelet count below 400 and hadn't had a blood clot at week 24. And they were generally well sustained, durable responses. There was no real change in symptoms overall. The great majority of the patients had a reduction in their mutant level. Generally well tolerated, few thrombotic events. And we will shortly be opening in the UK a, um, a phase three study comparing bombardemstat with best available therapy um, as a second line study. So again, a really exciting new drug. We haven't really had any new drugs in um, ET since what, anagrolide more than 20 years ago. So you no, know, it's still, it's not to be clear, it isn't available outside of a clinical trial, but if the phase three study shows you know, uh, um, that it's an effective drug, that might be something that's coming in the next few years. So this is the third um, abstract, and this is looking at um, adolescents and young adults with ET and PV. So this is, I think, kind of like the brainchild of um, Jean-Jacques Kilesian in Paris, as well as Claire here in London. It was a, um, a European-wide cohort of a, people all, around, all across Europe, um, patients all across Europe being um, collect, uh, the, the, the data was collected. 
So what we're looking for with people who've got ET or PV that was diagnosed when they're aged 25 years or less than 25 years, that's less than 10% of all patients. So just to be clear, this is not, if you like, absolutely typical MPN. So it's not clear whether the observations that we find in this group of patients necessarily apply to older patients. But it's still interesting just because of what it shows, and I'll, I'll come to that. It's an international collaboration, um, basically coordinated by the um, European Hematology Association, Association MPN Working Group. It was a mixture of ET and PV patients, um, mostly ET. You can see it's a median age of 20 years old. And if you think MPNs generally have a median age in the 60s at diagnosis, you can see this is a really very young cohort of patients. Nonetheless, two thirds of patients or more received cytoreductive therapy. The most common reason they needed it was for elevated platelet count. You'll recall that most people who need cytoreductive therapy, particularly older patients, is either because they're over 60, which obviously none of these patients were, or if they had a blood clot in the past, and actually only 14% of patients needed it. So sometimes if you've got a very high platelet count, for instance, um, you know, you, you know, we give um, cytoreductive treatment because people can just get a bleeding tendency associated with a super, super high platelet count. You can see here that if you just look at the first column where it says all, over half the patients got hydroxycarbamide. So, so these are of the 68% who, who required cytoreductive therapy, about half of those had hydroxycarbamide and of the rest, most of them either got interferon or anagrolide. I'm gonna to skip to the conclusions now. So first of all, in this young cohort of patients, the overall survival was excellent. You can just see here. So this is if it was if this line stayed all across the top, it would be 100% survival. It's dipped down to about 98%, but it means 98% of patients are still alive after 20 years. And actually, the few patients who did die, often the cause wasn't directly related to the ET or PV. Um, in terms of protecting patients from thrombosis, I'm not going to show the data, but in, in interferon and agrolide and hydroxycarbamide appeared equally effective, so we didn't see any difference in efficacy. The um, white cell count did seem to predict, so if people had a higher white cell count, that did slightly increase the risk of blood clot, but slightly surprisingly, if people had an enlarged spleen, it seemed to reduce the risk. I'm not sure what to make of that. Now, about 20% of people did progress to myelofibrosis at 20 years after diagnosis. So in the first two decades, there is about a 20% risk of developing myelofibrosis. So this is still an ongoing issue because you can imagine if you're diagnosed at the age of 20, you know, you've got 60, 70 years of healthy life ahead of you, um, ideally. And so you know, the question is, is there any way to try to reduce that risk? So this is the interesting thing. So that patients receiving interferon, so we said that about 20% of patients got interferon, 50% got hydroxycarbamide, about 20% got anagrolide. That 20% who got interferon seemed to have a lower risk of developing myelofibrosis than the patients who got other cytoreductive drugs or none. So if you look, the green line goes completely straight across the top. None of them develop myelofibrosis. Whereas if you look at the patients who didn't get interferon, um, we're only left about 75% without myelofibrosis. That means that about 25% over the 20 years got myelofibrosis. So it's certainly very tempting to say, look, patients who got interferon seem to have a reduced risk of developing myelofibrosis. Now, it's really important to say this was not a, um, an interventional study. It wasn't a randomized study. So we don't know whether the patients who got interferon had, um, was in a, some way different to those who got the other drugs. And you know, are we necessarily seeing an interferon effect? But it's certainly very thought provoking to see in this specific group of people, does, did interferon protect them? We don't know that it's something that we need to look at in the future, but it is a really thought provoking conclusion from this very, very interesting um, um, observational study. And then for the last couple of minutes, this is a very um, nice Danish study uh, comparing hydroxycarbamide versus pegylated interferon. And this is first line treatment. 
Um, and so you can see they divided people up into less than 60 or greater than 60. And those who are greater than 60 had a choice of, so this, the top one is Pegasus, that some of you may be familiar with. This is a different form of pegylate interferon, and this is hydroxycarbamide. But under 60 just got Pegasus or the alternative version um, called Pegintron. Um, and then they followed them up um, 60 months. Um, I'm just going to show you that you ba basically, um, uh, actually, I'm going to skip through that. And just to skip straight to the conclusions of this, in terms of clinical response rates, there was no difference. So this is in terms of controlling blood counts, controlling symptoms, et cetera. There was no difference between hydroxycarbamide or PEG interferon going out to five years. But there's a bit of a nuance to that in that patients who tolerated the PEG interferon, so quite a lot of patients who would start on the interferon actually had to stop it. And that's my next point, that about 65% um, had to stop it for one reason or another. Those who managed to continue on it did actually seem to get better responses. So the kind of the bottom line was if you could, if you can manage to stay on the interferon, the responses were a little bit better than hydroxycarbamide. And certainly the interferon reduced the JAK2 level significantly better than the hydroxycarbamide did. So if we look at the red curve here, so this is a JAK2 level, you can see it starts at an average for both of them between about 30 and 40 percent. But the red is a peg interferon, and you can see that there's a gradual reduction in the mutant level of the JAK2 over the five years. This hydroxycarbamide comes down initially, but then kind of bounces around, but doesn't really drop much further. And these dots tell me that, that actually that the interferon had a significantly better um, impact on reducing the JAK2 level. Now, perversely, the hydroxycarbamide seemed to control the fibrosis better. One of the things we worry about in ET and PV is the risk of developing fibrosis. And you can see that on the hydroxycarbamide group, this column here, only about 9% seemed to get worsening fibrosis, whereas the interferon, 44% got worsening fibrosis. And it was statistically significant. And again, there was a few caveats that a number of the hydroxycarbamide patients, we couldn't, we couldn't interpret their bone marrows. Did that change the result? We don't know. But again, it just shows that just because we see a result, for instance, in the um, uh, controlling the JAK2 level, that doesn't necessarily translate to controlling fibrosis. So those are the four studies I thought the most interesting. I'm just going to now very quickly try to take away the kind of the, the most important points. So this was resfertide in PV to try to, if you like, get rid of venesection. It markedly reduced the need for venesection. It allowed the ferritin to normalize and it seemed to improve some symptoms. So it's certainly very promising. The next um, is bombardemstat. It controlled the platelets in the majority of people with ET. It reduced the mutant level in many patients, so over 80%, but didn't seem to impact symptoms. This was a young patient study, very young group, excellent overall survival, but 20% risk of developing myeloid fibrosis at 20 years and interferon use may reduce this risk. And finally, the Danish study I just talked about, in terms of response, the interferon and hydroxycarbamide was similar, but the discontinuation rate was higher in interferon patients. Interferon seemed to be better at reducing the mutant level. Hydroxycarbamide, perhaps better at controlling fibrosis, but it's very difficult to say. So thank you all very much for listening. And I just want to put a final one minute plug in for Mithridate, because I think it's a really important study for people who've got PV. So if you've got PV and you've either only been on one treatment for a little while or you've not had any treatment and you know, your doctor thinks you may need treatment because of any of these factors, then please ask about the Mithridate study because it's giving you the, op the potential to get ruxolitinib or a best available therapy. It is what's called a randomization. It's a really, really interesting question because what we don't know um, is whether ruxolitinib as a first line treatment for polycythemia is as good or better than conventional treatments. There's lots of centers open. It's open for at least another year. So please, if you've got PV and you think you might be eligible, um, ask your doctor whether you might be eligible for the Mithridate study. On that note, I'm going to say thank you very much.
And I'm going to hand over to uh, Beth. Thanks, John. That was terrific. Um, let me just share my screen. Just move this one out of the way. Right. Can you see that all? OK, I hope so. So, yeah, so in the, in the last 15 minutes then, um, so it's my job to really um, talk a little bit about some of the more earlier um, work, the earlier scientific work that's being being done and was presented at ASH. Um, as Claire and John out, outlined, it's a really huge meeting and half of the people who go are clinicians or doctors and the other half are, are scientists who don't work with patients or treat patients, but they do work in their laboratories um, to try and... Um, to try and uh, understand why people develop MPNs and to try and identify new treatments. So I've got two halves to my talk. Firstly, I was going to focus on some of the emerging treatments, which are mostly really still being tested in the laboratory, um, that specifically target the MPN clone. That includes um, patients who carry the most common mutation that you've probably all heard about, this mutation in a gene called JAK2, and I'll talk a little bit about that in, in the next couple of slides plus also the agents that Claire referred to, which are targeting calreticulin. Um, and then in, in, the, in the last sort of third of the talk, I'll bring to you a little bit of the more basic science that was presented. There was so much, to be honest, it was really hard to pick. So I just picked a couple of my personal favorites and perhaps we'll cover a few things which, which um, you might not have, have thought about before, about why some people are more susceptible to MPNs, why some people might develop ET versus PV, and to talk a little bit about some, some new facts um, about um, about blood platelets, which I'll introduce to you as well. So um, for the first um, section then, talking about emerging treatments that specifically target the MPN clone. Um, so this hasn't been covered yet, but some of you may know this. So what we're looking at here is pie charts of people who have polycythemia vera, essential thrombocythemia, or myelofibrosis. And we know that basically almost all people who have PV, um, their condition is driven by a, a mutation affecting a gene called JAK2. Whereas um, whilst this is the most common mutation in people with ET and myelofibrosis, a significant portion of these people have instead a different mutation affecting a gene called calreticulin. And just to explain to you how those are working, basically all the blood in our body is being produced by a factory of blood producing cells inside the bone marrow. These are called blood stem cells. As we all age, um, uh, the blood stem cells can basically acquire little typing errors in, in, their, in their genome, in their DNA, so that the, the, um, the instructions within a cell that tell it how to behave. Um, and if those mutations affect one of these two genes, that means those stem cells no longer for signal, no, no longer listen for the signals telling them how many blood cells to produce. They just burst out and keep producing the cells anyway, regardless of the circulating cell numbers. And that's how those two mutations work. So um, we know, and probably um, you've all heard about this, that, that one of the mainstays of treatment, particularly for, for myelofibrosis, but also now being used as second line for patients with polycythemia, um, are these JAK inhibitors. Um, really, um, the mainstay of treatment here is roxolitinib, although we now have fedratinib as a second line agent and momolotinib, which was more recently NICE approved. So all of the current JAK inhibitors don't selectively inhibit the, the mutant form of JAK which means that basically they're suppressing our healthy stem cells um, as, as, at the same rate, really, as, as they're suppressing the, the MPN clone itself. So they aren't able to select just the MPN cancer cells and leave alone the healthy stem cells. They just basically put a dampener on blood cell production across the board. One of the most exciting studies I think that's coming through and was presented in an oral abstract at ASH was a new type of JAK inhibitor. So this was presented by a group from uh, the company called Insight. So Insight actually were the people who first developed ruxolitinib and they've got a new JAK inhibitor, which has got this long name here. So in INCB and then 160058, um, which they were showing data to suggest that it's much more selective for the mutant form of JAK2 rather than the wild type JAK2. And I've just got a couple of slides to show you how that's working. So this is quite a complex diagram, but I'm going to walk you through it. So what you're looking at here is the, is, the, is the outside membrane of the stem cell inside the bone marrow. And you can see it's got this, this structure here, which is actually a, a, a receptor for signals or hormones um, coming to it, telling it how many cells to produce. Now, when that, when that signal 
binds this receptor. You get these two halves of the receptor being pushed together and that switches on uh, blood cell production by the cell. Now, what they, what they uh, were able to do was to develop this new form of a JAK inhibitor, which pushes apart those two halves of, the, of, the, of, the, of that cell surface receptor, preventing its signaling. And most importantly, it's only able to do this in cells which carry the JAK2 mutation and doesn't push apart the two halves of the receptor in the cells that have a wild type JAK2. So in this plot here, they're, they're quantifying how many cells have these two halves of the receptor stuck together um, when they add the new JAK inhibitor. And you can see that stays the same. So it's almost all of them in the wild type cells, which are in blue, whereas in the cells which carry the JAK2 mutation, this V617F mutation, you see a decrease with the increasing doses of this JAK2 um, inhibitor. So that isn't the case if you were to use roxalitinib or any of the other licensed JAK inhibitors, that, that would be the same then for the blue and the green cells, all of them being suppressed. So they also looked to see how, how well this agent was able to kill cells in a dish. So again, they took two cell lines. So these are cells that originally long, long time ago actually came from patients with different types of MPNs or indeed even leukemias. These cells have now been passaged many, many times in the laboratory and are grown in dishes. And we often use these to test new drugs in the laboratory. So if you look at this plot here on the left, what you're looking at is the proportion of cells which remained alive versus having been killed by the drug. And they're using one cell line here, which has a normal or a healthy um, type of JAK2. And the green cells here have a mutant form of the JAK2. And you can see when they add the doses of this drug, it's only really suppressing the growth and, and, and the viability or, or the number of cells which are alive of the mutant JAK2 cell line. And then finally, one of the final steps we do when we validate um, drugs preclinically, so before they enter clinical trials, is do experiments in mouse models. So here, these are actually really difficult experiments to do because you need to get special types of mice um, that have no immune system, so they don't reject patient cells. The mice get a, a very low dose of irradiation here, um, and then you transplant them with cells donated by patients. So that's what they're showing here. So you have a mouse who's been irradiated and you basically give the mouse a stem cell transplant. The mouse then develops a form of an MPN and you can then randomize the mouse to, to receive different types of therapies. So, so the outcome of these experiments is shown in these plots here. And you can see in this red plot here, here they're looking at what happened when they treated the mice with roxalitinib. And you can see that the cells which were suppressed, this is looking at the stem cells, it was equivalent between the wild type cells and the cells that carried the JAK2 mutation. Whereas when they used their agent, their selective inhibitor, at this particular dose here, they saw a much more selective suppression of the, of the mutant stem cells. But actually, if you look at the, at the survival rates of the healthy stem cells that don't carry the mutation, those are maintained at 100%. So that's really important because it's suggesting that in, in an animal, when they use a selective inhibitor, they're only inhibiting the proliferation of the mutant clone, leaving behind those healthy stem cells that still exist, which hopefully then could, could, um, could, could regrow and uh, maintain their competitive advantage against the, the malignant clone. So this is still, um, still in development, this agent, um, but they're hoping to start clinical trials really probably towards the end of this year, or, or really more realistically, it might well be the end of next year. So Claire also mentioned in her last slide that we, we also now have some agents which are specifically targeting that second most common mutation. This is in the gene called calreticulin. And this, uh, again, I'm showing here a diagram of a blood stem cell existing within the bone marrow. And again, it's got a surface receptor on it. And you can see when people have this, this mutate, mutant um, form of a protein called calreticulin, um, you get a very interesting scenario where, where the, the mutant calreticulin binds to this, um, this signal receptor within the cell and then travels up to the cell surface. And that means that the, the mutant stem cells, the cancer stem cells, are presenting their mutant protein on their cell surface. And then this diagram here is, is, a, is a, a, an image of an antibody. And people are, the, the, what, 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 we're, what we're doing is basically people are developing therapeutic antibodies that can be used in the clinic that can specifically identify the cells which are displaying this mutant calreticulin and then hopefully remove them from circulation. So this, the, the, this, um, a lot of science has gone into discovering how this mutation works. Um, and we know that this gives us a really unique opportunity to specifically target the cancer clone using immune therapies such as antibodies.
So we actually have a number of clinical trials already in progress in this field. Um, some of you may know about a vaccine study that's currently open. Um, it's definitely open in, in at least three centres in the UK and a number of other centres worldwide. Um, this is again targeting that mutant carreticulin, but also actually some of the some some portions of proteins um, being presented on on the cells um, that that, uh, that are due to the JAK2 mutation. Um, last year at ASH, so not this one just gone, but the one before that, Insight again presented um, a therapeutic antibody uh, that again inhibits that receptor, those two, two portions of the receptor sticking together. Um, but this year at ASH, we heard another exciting presentation um, from Janssen, another company who talked about their antibody, which works in a slightly different way. So this antibody has two arms one which binds on the mutant carreticulin on the stem cells, and the other one reaches out and, and catches uh, T cells, immune cells circulating in the blood and inside the bone marrow. And the T cells are really important um, killers of cells which they see and, and identify as being foreign or harmful. So the idea of this antibody is it basically draws together T cells, um, which are immune cells circulating in your blood, with the MPN cells and asks the T cells then to activate and remove the MPN cells from circulation. So this is the structure of their antibody again. Here's an MPN cell and here's a T cell and you can see this T cell is then activated and releases um, proteins from inside the cell that cause what's called cytotoxicity. So it causes this cell then to burst and die. So it acts as a bridge between the CAR mutant MPN cells and T cells, inducing T cell activation and cytotoxicity and it's thought to actually recognize all the different types of the CALAR mutations that exist. So patients often have different types of mutations in their CAL reticulin, and this antibody is thought to work actually for all of them, which is, which is great news. So here's a little bit of the data. Again, what I'm showing you here is, is, is how these antibodies work in a dish. So in, in experiments in the lab, you have these tissue culture dishes. You can fill them with, with again, with cell lines, and that's what they've done here. Oh, actually, sorry, no, this is with cells from a patient um, or from multiple patients. So they've taken cells from patients, and then they've taken the patient's own T cells, mixed them together in the dish, and then they've either added a control antibody that they know doesn't do anything or the active antibody. So on the left here, you've, they've done the experiment where they've taken cells from patients who have the JAK2 mutation. And here they've taken uh, cells from patients who have the calreticulin mutation. And in red, you can see when they've added the active antibody, they go, don't get any killing for the JAK2 samples, but they do get very, very effective killing when, when they add the antibody to cells from patients that have the mutant carreticulin uh, mutation. So this is, is very nice data because it's showing how highly selective this is to the presence of the mutant carreticulin and isn't causing toxicity to healthy cells or cells which, which um, happen to have a different mutation. And this is along the x-axis here, you have an increase here in antibody concentration. Um, so they also did some work then um, in a mouse model. And here again, this is looking at survival of the mice so here in red, um, here's how the mice, sorry, in black here, the black line here are the mice who don't receive any treatment. And you see after the mice were given, um, actually it was, a, it was a cell line in this case, but after they're given um, the, um, the mutant calreticulin cells, the mice start to die here around 40 days later. Um, but here in, in the red, um, when the mice have been given the therapeutic antibody, the mice are basically all living. So that's, that's very encouraging. Um, these mouse models tend to be quite aggressive, which is why you see this drop off quite, quite early. So in the second part then of the talk, I'm going to cover a little bit of the science. And um, the first thing we'll talk about is, is, why, um, is why some people are more susceptible to developing an MPN. And then in the second part, I'm going to share with you some really amazing new facts, I think, about our circulating blood platelets and what they carry inside. Um, I'll talk a little bit about a condition called clonal hematopoiesis, how we can then analyze platelets um, as being biomarkers um, of the risk of developing fibrosis. And then in the last couple of slides, just a bit of fun stuff, really, to, to look at some videos of how I think platelets can be really informative, even beyond thinking about MPNs, just because I thought they, you might enjoy hearing something a bit new and a bit different. So the first abstract I'm going to talk about is, is, um, is work led by somebody called Jyoti Nangalia, who some of you may have heard of. She's a really terrific clinician scientist who works in Cambridge. And actually, she was part of the team or part of one of the teams that actually discovered the calreticulin mutation about 10 years ago. So she did a very nice study um, trying to understand how our background genetics influence whether or not we're likely to develop a myeloproliferative neoplasm. So you may or may not know that we, that people aren't usually, um, they, they don't usually inherit 
these um, MPN driver mutations from their parents, but people develop these mutations um, either in utero or after birth. We actually now know that, 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 that as many as one in 30 healthy people carry a JAK2, JAK2 mutation, but only a tiny proportion of, of people actually go on to develop an MPN. So why should that be? Well, GOT analyzed um, a really powerful data set that's been collected across the UK called the UK Biobank. This contains um, uh, hundreds of thousands of donors, people who've basically donated samples um, to, for, for whole genome sequencing. And then she's unpicked this data to try and understand how does our background genetics influence whether or not we're likely to develop an MPN. And what she's looked at is basically how random variations in our genome that don't cause disease, but they do alter how our body interprets um, interprets other, in, other insults or experiences uh, that are around us, including infections and the, the acquisition then of potentially cancer driving mutations. So she asked, how do these random variants um, predispose some people more than others um, to developing an MPN? And what she found was that certain people carry these variants which causes them to naturally have slightly higher blood cell counts, in particular, slightly higher numbers of a type of cell called a monocyte, and then a slightly higher number of the circulating little cells called platelets. And these people who have slightly higher numbers are more likely um, to, to then develop or present with really um, an MPN. And she also looked at the, at the scores or the, the, the presence of random variations in the genome. And she found that um, certain uh, phenotypes or certain genotypes, certain collections of variants um, seem to predispose people to develop ET versus PV. So the genetic background of somebody influenced how uh, the MPN mutation would read out, whether it would cause an ET or a PV phenotype. So this is a really nice study, which basically says that, as well as many other factors which might influence um, how the mutation actually acts and the eventual impact on your blood, your background genetics is, is one of the important factors. So then uh, lastly, I'll talk a little bit about platelets. So you've probably all heard us talk about platelets in terms of one of the cell types that we need to control in the cell number. Of course, people with both ET and PV tend to have too many circulating platelets. Well, what are these cells? Well, they're actually really, really tiny cell fragments. They're little dots. And um, I showed one on my first slide in, in a blood film. They're much smaller than the other cell types in, in the body. Um, they don't contain a nucleus, which is shown here. Um, and they're most famous, really, for their role in blood clotting. So they're the cells which gather together whenever there's been a break in the blood vessels and they cause a clot to then to then stop, stop bleeding. They also play a number of other really important roles in the body. So they're important in immunity. Um, and they're also well recognized over now really hundreds of, of years of research to play a role um, in cancer biology as well. And they carry around um, proteins, which they release um, at sites of, of whenever blood vessels are a little bit perturbed. So the platelets are produced by these cells in the bone marrow called megakaryocytes. So the name says mega, and that's because they're really, really huge. They're actually one of the largest cells in the human body. And they have this massive nucleus, which gives them a huge capacity to produce things, including um, blood platelets. And they make billions of platelets every single day. So platelets themselves, as I said, they don't contain a nucleus, but they are very highly functional. They're packed full of these granules and these little sacs inside. And when they activate, they release all their granular contents to the outside. They're also very good at actually sucking up stuff that they encounter. So if they come across proteins or other cell types or things which they find interesting, they often just engulf them and take them on their inside and then they can spit them back out again. So they're quite sort of dynamic cells. So one of the nice abstracts, which was, uh, which was uh, work led by Adam Mead and, and the first author was Nikos Susos, Susos done here in Oxford. Um, they studied platelets um, in the circulating blood and they showed that actually studying platelets gave you a window into the genome of the blood stem cells that otherwise might not have been apparent. So we know that actually when when um, when your body makes makes all the different circulating blood types, you have here megakaryocytes, red cells, the different types of white cells, these all come from common ancestors called, called stem cells inside the bone marrow. Now we know that these stem cells aren't all the same. Some of them are more biased, more, more, more likely to give rise to white cells. Others are much more likely to give rise to, to megakaryocytes. And work that was produced actually also in Oxford, but now some years ago, showed that some of our stem cells, um, they, they only ever produce megakaryocytes and platelets. And these stem cells never give rise to these other cell types unless there's an emergency um, in the body, then they sort of re-divert and then they'll produce the other cell types. <laughs> 
So what they showed is they looked at the platelets and they looked at the white cells and they found that actually some people only have evidence of MPN driver mutations and other types of mutations as well, only existing in their blood platelets. So there's another precursor condition to an MPN, which some of you may have heard of called clonal hematopoiesis. And this is a scenario where people basically don't have any changes to their blood counts. They don't actually have a blood condition really, but they do actually carry um, a gene mutation such as JAK2 or another mutation that is associated with blood disorders. Now these people don't have a blood malignancy, but they are more likely to develop heart disease, um, diabetes, and they have an overall higher, a slightly higher um, overall mortality, although it's very, very slight. And this has been shown in some really large cohort studies. So what um, Nikos has shown in his study is that as well as studying people's white blood cells, if we also look at people's platelets, will pick up on some additional cases of clonal hematopoiesis. And this might be important because of course, those platelets are important in blood clotting. Maybe it's important to pick up on people who've got these mutations that are selectively reading out in their blood platelets. Then there was another interesting study also looking at, at um, how platelets can be useful in diagnosing disease. So this comes from Australia from again, another brilliant um, scientist called Belinda Guo. So she looked at um, the number of RNAs. So this is the, the, the transcript or the readout of your genome. Um, it's the message that's created from the genome that then tells cells which proteins to make. So the RNAs are carried in the blood platelets and they usually come again from the parent megakaryocytes. So she looked at all the RNAs that are carried by blood platelets and she looked in people who've got PV, people who've got ET, and then people who've got myelofibrosis. And she found that these four genes really very highly significantly were increased only in the patients with myelofibrosis. And what this suggested is that by studying people's platelets, this may be possible, it may be possible to basically detect and diagnose the presence of fibrosis without the need for a bone marrow. So you may get some hints from looking at the RNAs carried in blood platelets about the presence of, of developing scarring or fibrosis inside the bone marrow. And then the last one I was going to talk about was thinking about how platelets can be, um, a, be, be a useful biomarker of disease beyond even MPNs. So I'm showing here some work from a PhD student actually in my lab, which was presented not in the MPN setting, but I thought it was quite fun to share with you today, looking at how circulating blood platelets also collect DNA fragments that are present in our blood. So what you're looking at here is this is in a dish. So you've got a, a, actually a colon cancer cell here in a dish, and she's taken some platelets here from healthy people and put them inside with these colon cancer cells in a dish. And you can see the platelets are really busy sort of swimming around looking for stuff to find. And if you look on this video in the left, you can see that the platelet here is gradually picking up some of the pink material. And all these platelets here have already done that and they're circulating, carrying this cargo of pink. And what the pink is, is it's before we put the, the cells together, we dyed the DNA inside the colon cancer cells pink with a special dye. And, and as those colon cells are there, they're basically releasing it into the media and the platelets are picking this up. And this is actually something we didn't know that platelets did. So we've uncovered really a bit of novel biology about what platelets do in our circulation. Interestingly, we also then took some samples from pregnant mums. Um, to really show that this happened inside a human. We took samples of blood from, from pregnant mums and we asked whether we could see bits of baby's genome. So we purposely looked at mums who were carrying male children. And indeed what this video is showing here is a platelet in blue. And you can see within that platelet, you can see a, a tiny fragment there of the Y chromosome. So we looked in, a, in a, quite a small cohort of pregnant mums, but we found that by looking inside their platelets, we were really accurately able to predict the sex of the baby which is quite fun. And actually the fetal DNA was stayed inside mum's platelets for about two days after they, they delivered. So that's quite an interesting thought for those of us who've had children, that the bits, bits of baby's genome stick around in our platelets for a little bit, even after, after we've given birth. And then um, interestingly, we also looked um, in patients who have very, very early pre-malignant lesions growing in their colon. So people who get things called polyps in their, in their colon, we asked whether platelets could also pick up bits of the polyps. And, and here we, we, we're looking for a particular mutation that's causing the polyp to grow. So we're looking inside platelets and, and we found the presence of this mutation inside someone's platelets, even when they're really, really small polyps. Polyps which are hard to see using a colonoscope or a telescope test that goes inside the colon. So that's a bit of fun biology. And I thought that would be interesting to share with you because it's probably something you didn't know um, about platelets, even though you hear a lot about platelets in the clinic.
So to summarise, I think it's a really exciting time for MPNs. I think eventually we have some hope that more targeted therapies may become available in the near-ish future. Of course, the, the particularly the first agent I talked about, it's got a lot of it's got a long road still ahead in terms of validation preclinically, um, and also then to go through clinical trials. Um, and finally, to say that we're really fortunate in the field to have a really terrific community of motivated and collaborative science scientists. Um, and it just so happened as I was doing my slides, I realized I've actually focused on quite a lot of work coming from women. And of course, today is International Women's Day. So I'd like to give a particular thanks to, to Claire, who's um, of course arranged this meeting uh, for being such a terrific role model for so many of us um, in the field. And lastly, just to thank everyone on the call and particularly to patients for donating samples to research, for participating in trials and for informing research for the future. So thank you very much. And I think, um, I think maybe now, um, I uh, stop and I think maybe it's time for questions. Let me that stop. That was amazing. I love the video of the platelets. That's <laughs> fantastic. I suppose it's important to um, just clarify that um, I don't think that suggests that there's any extra risk for anyone that's got totally. high numbers of platelets, right? But... No, 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 no. They're just, they, they were just looking inside the platelets. They're not actually driving any of the cancer or anything like that. They're just mopping up stuff that's in the blood. They're amazing. Like Thanks all of you. That was fantastic. So I didn't see any particular extra questions in the chat, but I'm very pleased to, um, oh, I love that platelets like Pac-Man. That's yeah. definitely true, isn't it? Actually? <laughs> um, yes. So, but welcoming Susie, who's just joined MPN Voice, I think, and who put a message in the chat. So we did have some pre-submitted questions. So I'm going to actually give the first one to Natalia. And the, Natalia, the first question is, please talk about breathlessness as part of ET. Perfect, thank you. Well, um, can I just say I love also the, the videos, Beth, they're really fun. Um, so I think first thing, when we're thinking about symptoms related with this ET or whatever other disease, we need to understand one, how acute is this or how was the presentation and see if there is any other symptoms associated to that. Obviously, in patients with high platelets, our main concern if there is any clot on your lungs, so they need to be investigating for that quite prompt. Um, and then obviously there will be other things to keep in mind. Is this something, there's any other disease, for instance, any heart problems? Is there any underlying lung disease like asthma or, um, you know, chronic um, obstruction, uh, obstructive disease on your lungs so that can exacerbate with your high platelets? Um, but also I think we need to think if there is any treatment involved. So patients that have maybe peck into firm can have some lung um, disease or some side effects like pneumonitis, exacerbation of asthma again. So, you know, it's a lot of different things that you have to keep in mind. But obviously, I would say if there's something more acute, definitely we need to be sure there's not any clots on the lungs because of the high platelets. Um, but it's important to have a good medical history and you know, if there is any other medical um, treatments um, to, to try to understand what's the underlying cause of breathless. And not to forget that just because you've got ET doesn't mean you can't get something exactly. else like a chest infection. Right? Exactly. Um, super. So, um, John, there's a question here from Jeanette who says, having had ET for 27 years with only one bone marrow biopsy at the start of diagnosis, should I have another one? I can't believe someone's volunteering to, Going to say that. Right? It's usually <laughs> the other way around. Um, so, I mean, in broad terms, I'm not as big a fan of bone marrow as I used to be in the sense that, you know, when I first became a consultant, I was, I was very keen to get everyone have a bone marrow because it gives us a really good sense of where things are. We can put numbers to things. Actually, you realize over time, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference to the vast majority of people and it's uncomfortable and some people actually really hurt. And there's a, you know, there is a small but definite risk of complications. So the bottom line is I don't tend to recommend bone marrows unless, sorry, sequential bone marrows, unless there's a change in condition. So either someone's getting more symptoms or their spleen suddenly gets bigger or their blood count suddenly drop and something changes. And even then I'll sometimes wait a little while before diving in with a bone marrow. So, so obviously I can't speak specifically about your case. I don't know exactly what your situation is. In broad terms, I know if, if you've had a bone marrow diagnosis and things haven't particularly changed, I can't see any reason why you should have a bone marrow now. 
And maybe in the future, you know, some of this lovely stuff that Beth was showing us about, you know, the, I think it was um, Belinda's um, data, actually, we might be able to do something else that might tell us a bit more. Absolutely. But the bone marrow is really, it's really important. And we are looking at it sort of scientifically. So, um, but yeah. Um, Beth, um, Jenny Reynolds asked a question about fluctuations in platelets. Why do they fluctuate? Yeah, so I so I, I mentioned cells in the body called megakaryocytes. So these are the cells in the bone marrow that produce all our circulating blood platelets. So what, what a healthy megakaryocyte should be doing is, is listening for the message that says, make more platelets, make more platelets. Now, when people have an MPN, often that the, 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 the listening goes off, they're closing their ears, they're just pumping them out anyway. Um, but sometimes they're still a little bit responsive to the signal. Now, the signal itself can sometimes get absorbed by platelets themselves. And sometimes patients get in a scenario where, where um, the, the TPO, the hormone that's telling the cells how, how many platelets to produce gets all mopped up. And then suddenly it's released again and you get these waves, this sort of cycling in platelet counts. Um, so one of the reasons can be due to how the platelets are being produced in the body. Then, of course, another reason is, 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 is what happens to the platelets once they're produced. And sometimes they're just cleared more rapidly due to other things that are going on, like infections um, or changes to your medications. Sometimes even stress can alter this. Um, so there are many factors which basically tell the body how many platelets to produce and then, of course, how long those platelets live for. And these things can sometimes interact to cause these changes in platelet counts, even in people who've got very stable disease. Great. And then there's a on the subject of ET, there's a question about have you any patients without a spleen who've got ET? I lost my spleen after a sporting injury it does happen. And I have ET. So I think one of the things that can push your platelets up is actually having no spleen because um, old platelets get destroyed in the spleen. But um, it is unusual to not have a spleen, but some people are actually born without a spleen, believe it or not. Um, so it it is um, there are patients who have ET who do not have spleen. We we have an, another patient at Guy's. Um, and um, I'm sure that a robust diagnosis has been made because we can use things like mutation tests and a bone marrow biopsy, etc. Um, John, there's a question about PV and about, about COVID. And that's come from Ruth. I'm still being strongly advised to isolate as far as possible to avoid COVID. Is that still recommended? But maybe we can't um, advice specifically for you Ruth but maybe John you could just say what you talk to your patients about uh, I mean we, I think there's a number of common sense things that people can do so that's getting vaccinations because we've seen you know vaccinations are incredibly useful in protecting our patients against COVID you know, compared to the first what two years year and a half of the pandemic you know the 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 number of serious serious COVID infections coming and people coming into hospital has really gone down dramatically. So I think that just tells us how effective the vaccinations are. The second thing to say is, as far as I'm aware, people who've got MPNs who are taking cytoreductive therapy, if they get COVID, are still able to access the antiviral treatments. Um, I think that's still the case. I don't think that's changed. So again, that's a really important thing to know if you've got an MPN and you're taking cytoreductive treatment, you can get in touch with the hospital um, if you get COVID for advice about how to get um, the antiviral treatment. So back to your question about whether or not to uh, you know, kind of effectively sort of self-isolate. Uh, in the first two years of the pandemic, I told people basically to try to do that as much as possible. I think since then it's become clear that for most people, that probably isn't necessary, that it's really people who've got high risk features, so particularly older people, potentially with myelofibrosis, taking ruxolitib might be more susceptible. But again, I think with vaccinations, I think that's taken away a lot of the risk. Of course, there's other factors that you, other people that you may have, which we don't know about, which may increase the risk for you individually. Um, but as a rule, I think for most of my patients, unless they've got specific risk factors that I think given um, COVID complications, I tend to tell them to basically just be sensible, maybe, maybe not go out at the very busiest time on the tube or whatever. But in broad terms, I don't put specific constraints or limits 
on them. And one really important thing to say is if you get COVID, please don't stop your medication, particularly ruxolitinib, but any medication, you know, carry on taking it as normal. If you're eligible for the antivirals, that's great. Um, but don't stop your medications unless your consultant tells you to do that. Great. And you might be eligible for a COVID um, treatment, so you need to raise that with your team. So we're close to six o'clock and we haven't answered all the questions, but I'm going to pick one for each of my colleagues. And um, we will um, try to uh, I'll try to answer some by email afterwards. Um, so apologies, we didn't get all the way through them. And Beth, I would like to ask you about family history of MPNs and what the latest um, thinking is on them, please. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think I mentioned a little bit in my in my presentation. So we most MPNs are not inherited, as in they don't get passed directly down from parents to their children. That's very important. So the mutations themselves arise just in the blood. So they don't affect your sperm or your egg cells, and you don't pass them on to your children. However, having said that, we know that MPNs do tend to cluster in families, and we think that maybe because of your background genetics. There are some background genetics that are very clearly associated and others which are, have a more weaker association. Um, but the, the, the basic um, uh, thinking, the latest thinking on that is that some of us are just genetically more predisposed to have particularly higher blood counts and therefore we're more likely that if we get an MPN driver mutation or to be in that scenario when one might arise, um, we're more likely then to develop an MPN. Uh, but just to be really clear, they're not, they're not passed down to our children. Usually. Yeah. So if there are there are some families where there are several members with an MPN and, and uh, I think Adam is still interested in collecting samples from those um, yeah. families. So, again, have a chat to your doctor and, and we we all talk to each other all the time on emails yeah. and whatnot. Um, so, Natalia, a question from Jill, who I can see has got her camera on. How do you see the potential new treatments impacting quality of life and ultimately life expectancy? Um, really good question, actually, because I think we we have few studies that have demonstrated how quality of life is affected in MPM patients. And I think all the clinical trials we run even um, different phases, we're looking on that answer. So I think we will learn more. But I think what I personally see now with some of the studies and the both um, John, Prof and Beth has discussed in the meeting today, we definitely will have an impact on quality of life. I think, for instance, if we think of momelotinib reducing your transfusion requirements, that definitely has an impact on you attending the hospital, you feeling more tired. Um, thinking on the previous studies, if we reduce the venous sections, then you probably have less iron on deficiency. Your fatigue levels maybe not got to you know, baseline, but definitely will have a positive impact and reduce that. So I think I see definitely we're looking more on the target in the quality of life or for patients. Um, and obviously the other big thing is how we impact on the life expectancies of patients. So again, we know from the rook solitinib long-term studies, it has improved the survival of our patients. But we, the fact that we have other options for patients that maybe fail roxolitinib or having on hydroxy and now can access to roxolitinib in PV definitely is going to have an impact on the life expectation on the long term, isn't it? And I think as Joe saw on this on the um, young patients as well, if we may be doing early interventions, are we going to be able to reduce or improve the quality, you know, the survival and, and the quality of life on the long term? I think that's definitely definitely I, th I I feel positive on that if that makes sense um, and I think we'll, uh, studies will show that improvement on our patients that's great um John I know you work in UCLH and you have a lot of transplant patients um and meanly, we didn't allocate you this question to start off with. We did go through the questions and allocate them. But could I just ask you the question about um, using the stem cells of your own child if you were to have a stem cell transplant, if you wouldn't mind? Because I know that some patients don't have a relative or may not have a match. So in terms of a haplo, who is that you're talking about? Okay. Yes. 
So I think the role of Haplo has kind of come on quite, so, so yes, yeah, so when I say Haplo, what I'm talking about is stem cells, let me start again. When we're talking about myelofibrosis allogeneic transplant, often the best donor is a sibling, a brother or sister, who's got, a, who's a complete match. And they, in many ways, they're the ideal donor. But obviously not everyone has got a sibling who's a match. So the question is, is it better to have a donor who is completely unrelated, what's called a matched unrelated donor from say the Anthony Nolan group or panel, or if, if they've got a son or a daughter, their son or daughter may, may be a 50% match for them, and then they may be a donor. And that's something that's become more common along the, um, along the way over the last 15, 10, 15 years, I'd say. And my understanding, I don't actually do the allographs myself, but certainly the preference is still, if there's a well-matched unrelated donor to go for that, but otherwise, if there's a haplo match, as I say, a child who's a 50% match, to potentially use them as a stem cell donor, but it's not cut and dried. So they'll look at the individual circumstances and how good a match the person is and other factors like potentially CMV as well. So it is really interesting because it potentially really widens the, the kind of the access to donors, but it's still not really as good as having a formally matched sibling um, in the longer term. That's great. Thank you so much. So I'm going to pass over to Nona now, but I want to thank my colleagues very much personally um, for all of their contributions. And Nona, I think we're coming over to you now. Thank you, Claire. Um, and I would like to say a huge thank you on behalf of MPN Voice to all the clinicians who you've given some amazing talks tonight. And I can't hope, I, I, I honestly have been blown away by them because they're simple and understandable. Um, and I'm sure the community will so agree. Um, I would also like to have a quick thank you to the MPN Voice team of Maz, Debbie and Charlie, who have enabled us to start doing these uh, forums online via MPN Voice. And one last thing, if you feel that you would like to, we would very much welcome um, some support financially. Uh, unfortunately, the slide isn't up, but you can donate through the Just Giving page which is www.justgiving.com forward slash MPN voice or contact Maz on info at mpnvoice.org.uk. And once again, so many thanks to you all. And we look forward to welcoming you at the next webinar. Good night. Mm -hmm.